Obvious. Uh, I come home and uh, it's, a, it's a different, uh, totally different from the life that I live there. Of course, I love my family and all of that. But the main reason why I come back is my grandmother. There's, you know, she's the woman that built me. You know, like there's so much of her in me, and uh, I come back because of her. <laughs> I have such a strong connection with home. There's so much fear, anxiety, happiness, sadness connected to home. Home here, Brazil, Uberlândia, it's a place that brings all these emotions all the time. And it's time too. That's good. So I become, I become much more sensitive when I come home because I live in Amsterdam, in a, in a bubble. So I'm not really connected with what's going on all the time as I'm here. You know? Here, I see things on the news and I see things on the streets. So it's not only the news, it's like reality, like on my side. And I, I'm not exposed to that in Amsterdam. You are very special. É tudo isso que todo mundo quer saber. <laughs> e é o que você é. Uh, ah. uh, when I was young, I was very uh, outgoing, never shy. I was always not at home. I was always doing something out, either at, at the neighbors or the, the street above. Um, and just playing around and a lot of dancing, a lot of music involved. Um, and in this area that we used to live, it's like this little town has, I think the area is it's called Esperanza, it's called, it's called hope, <laughs> which is sarcastic because it's, it's, there's no hope there. There is hope, but it doesn't look like we're just, just lost. This area had, I think it has eight streets and that's the whole area. So everybody knows each other, a lot of kids. Um, and I was always in the middle of the crowd. I was always catching attention. Some attention were good, but most of it were really bad. I was very bullied and I was called uh, many names as a kid. I was made fun for the way I talked, for the way I walked, and, and also for my dancing. But it was something so um, coming to me so many times a day that I kind of got used to it, that it didn't affect me anymore. I kind of became numb to the, to the mean comments and to the bullying, so I was just, I was just being me. I tried many times, my mother would tell me, Daniel, can you, can you stop? And I would try, but I never could. People really liked the way I danced when I was young. My mother was very embarrassed because she thought she had only one son and she wanted me like to be playing with little, little cars 
and she would always bring uh, these uh, toys for me and I would never play with them. I would go to my sister's uh, toys and and play with their toys and it's a lot of fighting too with my sister when I was young uh, between us because I would always get their stuff and and I would always annoy them. Tá lembra quando você jogou a lei de ano dentro da caixa d'água? Não! <risos> Tadinha. Ela era pequenininha. Deixei a baila com você um dia, dona Nézia está citando aquele barulho. Correu lá, você tinha jogado ela dentro da caixa d'água. Uma caixona grande, cheia d'água, e ele catou ela e jogou lá dentro. <risos> Because I was the only boy, I was never going to be punished. So I would like get them into trouble. And then <laughs> when seeing them, <laughs> you know, being punished for something that I did, I would be looking at them and laughing and pointing. I was, so you have an idea. I was <laughs> that kid. My mother was a funny woman because she knew that people love to see me dancing. So sometimes if she wanted like to have a little drink and she didn't have money, she would take me with her to the bars. The people would ask me to dance and she's like, yes, you can dance, but you have to pay. So she was, she was getting some money from my dancing back then. So that was the only time that I saw my mother happy, seeing me dancing, yeah. So my father, he was around, but not much because of his, his work. And I remember when we moved into this last place, we, 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 we lived together as a family. Um, he was there more often than, than ever until he, to the day he went to prison. And that's something that I don't want to talk about what he did because it's, it's a sensitive uh, topic for him and, and I want to respect that. So he went to prison and then we were left uh, with, my, with my mother. I was left with my mother and my, and my sisters. I had a very strong relationship with my older sister. Uh, because she was always there, uh, taking care of me and uh, taking me places and make, taking me to take a shower and putting clothes on me and making food for me. So, and she would play and we would talk and we, we were like very tight. And the relationship that I had with her was stronger than with my mother because she was, my mother was always uh, out and always uh, drinking, but she loved us, she really did. My mother passed away very suddenly. There wasn't a progress. She didn't get sick and you saw that she was not gonna make it. She, she had, from what I know, she had been out partying and drinking as usual. And she got in a, in a fight with a cousin of hers and, and 
I was told that he hit her in the head with a piece of wood and she passed out. And then she got better, then she went home. And the next day she had a purple eye and um, she, she was in bed the whole day and just feeling very hangover. And I remember she would ask me to go to the, to the bar and buy her alcohol, what we call the one that she used to drink was pinga, it's just pure, pure alcohol, similar to vodka. And uh, so I went to get her uh, her drink because she would drink the night before, get really hangover in the morning, and her way of curing the hangover was to drink more alcohol. So I went to get her her alcohol. And she had a little, little, uh, she would take the top of the bottle put the alcohol in and she would have a sip. So she had her sip and then I went out and I played as usual. I wasn't really concerned, I didn't really understand, I was really young. And then I came home and she wasn't feeling so good and my uncle took her, took her to the hospital and yeah, she never came back alive. After my mother passed, um, we were homeless because my father was not uh, was not around. I remember my older sister; she stayed in the house with my second oldest, and then me and my younger sister we were separated. So each of us went to live with somebody different, and then I went to live with my grandma. By this time, my younger sister also came to live with, with her. I think there was uh, something going on because I think if my grandmother did not uh, take us to live with her, I think the government or, or they would put us in a social house to be adopted. It was something like this that was happening. So she, she took us so she could take care of us. During that time, all the responsibilities of having a younger sister came to the picture. Because then, what my older sister was to me, I became to my younger sister. So I was her parent, because my grandma was working uh, five days a week, the whole day. For me, it didn't feel like when my father went to prison and my mother passed away. I didn't feel there was a shift because my life up to that moment was very... I don't want to deal with him or you take him or you take him, you know? I was never really like into a very solid... I, I was taken care of, I was given food and I, and I had clothes to to dress, but I was never like really taken care when I was a child. So when they were not there, for me, there wasn't much of a difference, especially uh, during the, the year after my mother passed, uh, when I was living at somebody's house here and somebody else's house there, um, until my grandmother took us. Why, Daniel? Foi meio difícil, porque eu trabalhava, não tinha quem cuidava de você. 
Aí eu fui te buscar, você ficar uns dias, de repente, eu achei que não dava certo, aí você ficou direto comigo. Aí você ficava sozinho, foi da onde que a sua tia te levou uns dias pra fazer. She tried to educate us, because during that, uh, when I was nine, nine and a half, I, I was like, I didn't, I wasn't educated in any way. I did not know how to, to listen. I, I did not know how to wait for my time. I was very difficult, so she gave me discipline. So it was the first time that I was disciplined and the first time that I was really uh, looked after. Yeah, so the shift happened there when my grandmother came to the picture when I, I felt like okay now now it's a uh, it's the real thing but that's very fashion and I remember my grandma uh, because she couldn't stay at home and take care of us she was every time she would like go to the kitchen and cook she would be Daniel come here I, I need to teach you how to how to make rice how to make beans and you know how to cook because she, she could not be there every day for us. So I remember with her, she teaching me in the kitchen and then asking me to make just the beans of the dinner or just the rice until one day like I had to do the whole meal. So it was kind of exciting at the moment because if I felt like, oh, okay, it's good. And I can cook good because of her. And she was very um, scared of having us being alone at home. So she put my younger sister into the baby class and I would go only to school in the morning uh, for I think a few months. Then she enrolled me in a social project here in Berlandia that doesn't exist anymore. Where I will go spend the afternoons uh, doing activities and uh, doing homework from, from school. So I remember I was going to school in the morning, really early, uh, taking my uh, baby sister to the baby class before I went to school very early and then come home, cook, eat, and then go to the social project. Essa brasilidade, né? Muito obrigada. And I remember there were a lot of uh, activities there. There were there were sports. There were artistic, like drawings, there were computer classes, and, and there was ballet as well. By that time, I had grown tough um, because I, I had suffered a lot of bullying and a lot uh, happened, like my mother, my father being away, and me having to now take care of a younger sister, and also myself, so I had like to, to be tough and be strong. So I did not want to, to, to do ballet because I thought, I am already a very flamboyant boy. And if I'm doing ballet, it's just like giving reason for my bullies to like keep calling me, you know, so. At first, I did not want to, but I had no choice. So that's how I, I got involved in the ballet classes. I didn't feel at first that it was something big. Like, it, I was just, uh, just doing it to do. I remember I had a friend who started with me. 
and in class uh, he was always the one that the teacher was looking at or or giving compliments and I was always the second one so there was the competitive uh, thing in class who who is going to do better it's not that if I liked it or not I just wanted to do better than him and I remember we were doing the, the ballet classes and, and fighting a lot because like if the teacher would give him a compliment like I would go and fight with him or if she gave me a compliment like he would come and fight with me too. So there was that relationship and uh, Guillemar, uh, my, my ballet teacher, um, not at the time. She had the school. She would come to the social project to to pick and choose the ones who were who were doing well. And Gilmar uh, came and she she chose me and she chose him to to go to to her school in the city center. And that's and that's how uh, uh, I, I I started. Tandi. Aqui, tan de poisson. Isso. J'étais tan levé, tombé, assemblé. J'étais tan levé, brisé volé de si, brisé volé de su. Glissade, j'étais, pas de bourré, tan de, e tan de poisson. Eu tinha um projeto numa instituição aqui em Uberlândia, chamada LAR. Nessa instituição, da qual o Daniel fazia parte, eu selecionava as crianças para o projeto Pé de Moleque. Foi lá que eu conheci o Daniel e de uma maneira bem inusitada. Quando eu cheguei nessa instituição para fazer a seleção dos alunos, estava fazendo um burburinho de uns meninos gritando, correndo atrás de um outro menino. Um baixinho, gordinho, carequinha. Era o Daniel. E como os meninos estavam tentando bater no Daniel, eu tinha uma bolsa quadrada, assim, e eu saí atrás desses meninos, batendo nesses meninos, separando o Daniel. E o Daniel tava na, entrou para a sala e a sensação que eu tive naquele momento, quando eu olhei para o Daniel, é que daquele momento em diante eu teria que cuidar do Daniel. Ele não era não ia ser uma relação apenas de professor e aluno, mas eu me senti como se eu fosse, como se ele fosse meu filho. E troa e GT. Sissone duplo rond é Sissone duplo rond. But the moment in which I actually liked it and, and saw as something magical as and I was really amazed by it. it was the social project took took all the students of, of to go to watch a performance and that was the moment when I actually saw a ballerina in the point shoes and and, and and the guy partnering her and the ballet was Arlik Nat. And uh, until this day when I, I listen to the to the music of it, I'm like so touched by it. It's so so beautiful. It's a comic ballet. And it's about it's about love and it's a lot of colors and it's very playful. And I remember just being like you know when you watch a Disney movie and it's like a very good one and you're like you are into it, like you are there. That that's how I felt. It was, it was really magical and also to be to see like somebody being able to, to move that that way. It was so like Amazing, it was mesmerizing. I loved it. Aí, você girar no seu eixo. Andedan, mesma coisa. Tá descoordenada. Passa o ombro esquerdo lá. Tomba, abre. There was a change, yes. And I went to the performance and I got more interested. But what I loved the most about going to the classes and, and be doing doing ballets because I was being praised all the time. Can you imagine for a boy who has been bullied his whole life and suddenly he's being praised and being uh, given compliments and, and being liked. And I, I loved that attention. 
And uh, I'm so glad my grandmother went uh, to the school when she enrolled me. E. Subiu. Continua subindo a pirueta. E. De costas. E. E. Because of my fighting habits in the social project when I was, was there, uh, I came to the school and my habit was still the same. So it was a lot of fighting, a lot of talk, talking back. So I remember I went through all the teachers in the, in the, in the, in the academy of Gilmar because nobody wanted to teach me. They would teach me one, two class and that's it. It'd be like, Gilmar, we don't want to, 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 to have this, to have this boy with us because I was causing distress in class. I was, I was fighting, I was talking, I was competing with my friend who was in the same class to, uh, and I remember, I think three months, maybe three months, I think I went through all the teachers at the school and Gilmar sat me down to have a meeting and Gilmar is a very sweet lady but very firm at the same time and she she knew how to like control us like I feel she was the only one that I was like kind of scared of and I had to respect you know and she sat me down and she was Daniel you have one last chance you're gonna come to to take class with with the with the adults it's the class that she was teaching which is the high level class and you have one chance if you miss one exercise, you're out of the school. And I felt challenged then. Now I think I understand that the habit that I had of fighting and not really being there present, it was because I felt like now I, I think because I felt I wasn't being taught enough or it was too easy because I always had facility to dance. I was, I was flexible and everything like, I never had really difficulties in the classes. So I felt it was going a bit slow. So I, I would be distracted and I would be talking and I would be playing and I would be fighting or I don't know. And then at Guillermo's class, I, I felt challenged and, uh, and I, I really worked hard and I, yeah, I didn't miss one exercise. Yeah. Ah, no Brasil existe um preconceito muito sutil que as pessoas elas sorriem, mas na hora das oportunidades as oportunidades não vêm. Então, para um bailarino negro de periferia, é muito difícil ter uma chance aqui. Primeiro porque a dança é uma profissão muito recente entre nós e ela carrega todas as mazelas de todas as outras profissões. Então, o que eu acho que o Daniel tem conseguido é mostrar para as pessoas que você não pode desistir, mesmo sendo minoria, mesmo tendo imensas barreiras, você tem que persistir porque isso pode não reverter para você, mas pode reverter para outras pessoas que estão vindo e que vão ajudar a construir esse caminho. E como já dizia o poeta, um caminho se faz com muitos passos, você tem que dar o primeiro. There was a big process. Uh before I went, I went to Canada to, 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 do, to do the school because uh, I did a lot of competitions. I did competitions here in Brazil. I did competitions in New York, in Lausanne, in China, in Argentina. So I was competing everywhere. And uh, I never really understood the purpose of the competitions. I was just going because Gilmar 
was taking me and of course an absolute chance for me to to dance different roles and like to challenge myself and um, then I went to the Prix de Lausanne in 2012 when I was a finalist and the, the main goal of that competition is to for, for a student to get a, a, a scholarship and and I did just that and um, me going to Canada was not a choice that I had um, or me going anywhere to study out of Brazil was never a choice that I had in mind before until the opportunity was right there. And yeah, it was, yeah, it was very, for me, very suddenly, even though everything that I had done prior to that was leading me to that moment, but I wasn't really aware of it. And I was very tricky with my grandmother uh, when I got this scholarship uh, to go to Canada because me going everywhere to compete, she had always to like sign documents and uh, so I could go. And uh, I never, I was never clear to her that me going to Canada was me going away for a whole year. Yeah, so she found out when she had already signed the, the papers and the process was already done and she's, and the tickets are bought and she's like, oh, okay, Daniel, so when are you coming back? And I remember just before that, I had gone to China and I stayed in China for two weeks and that's very long, the longest I've been away. And then she asked me, Daniel, so when are you, when are you coming back? I'm like, in a year? Yeah, but I had to be tricky, otherwise, I don't think she would have let me. <laughs> Eu acho que a gente não pode esquecer que o Daniel é da onde ele veio, né? Ele é um bailarino brasileiro, negro, da periferia. E eu acho que Toronto é uma cidade mais cosmopolita, onde ele poderia ser melhor representado e abrir novas oportunidades para outras crianças, para outros bailarinos, para outras bailarinas negras que sonham com essa profissão e não conseguem romper as barreiras. Eu acho que eu pensei muito em representatividade. Guilmar, from the beginning, she always told me, you are a dancer for the Dutch National Ballet. You have to go to Holland. Like, it's a place for you. Um, Guillaume and my teacher, Dan Stefanski, were the ones who, who made the decision for me. They were like, because everything they told me up, up to that moment, they never failed. You know, they knew me as a dancer and also as a person. So I, I had to go with that. Even though I felt comfortable in Canada and life uh, could be easy there, you know, and I was. I, I could stay there, I had a whole support system, but yeah, they told me to go because uh, I could be exposed uh, to many more things. And also the fact that being in Europe, everything's so close. Uh, yeah, that's why I went. Nós somos um país muito carentes de modelos. Então, eu me sinto uma pessoa muito privilegiada de poder conviver com essas pessoas em que eu posso citar nas minhas aulas como exemplo e que por aqui passaram, mesmo que seja brevemente. Claro que o Daniel é um exemplo de, de uma pessoa vencedora, porque não porque ele dança no Hat National Ballet, mas porque ele conseguiu ser uma pessoa digna, uma pessoa boa, uma pessoa que tem um olhar cúmplice para os seus amigos, para os seus semelhantes. E eu acho que a, a arte, na verdade, ela se trata disso, das humanidades. Então, o exemplo que eu procuro dar é esse, do amor, da compaixão, do companheirismo, porque, através disso, você pode construir 
qualquer outra coisa. The dream that I had when I was young, and I think it's the same one I have now, is just to and just to be a great artist. Yeah, just to be able to touch people and uh, and and change lives as my life was changed. Like when I was. T ten and a half year old, and I watched that ballet performance. Uh, something clicked there, you know, so magical. So my dream is to bring that magic. Yeah, it's it's nothing big, it's nothing glamorous. It's just to just to do it, you know, because the talent that I have, I believe it's it's of course there's a lot of work behind it and so it's a lot of blood and sweat behind it and a lot of uh, help from other people and also myself, you know, being in that position. But I also believe it was something given to me and I have to, you know, to, to use it and uh, yeah, exercise it and yeah, so the dream that I have and I, I'm living it and it's just to touch people and just, uh, I don't know, to be be a great artist, and, and that's something that um, it's a, it, it's always a working process. I don't want to be the best dancer in the world, you know. I, I want to be the best artist in the world. So it's different. Tudo, tudo, meu filho. Vovó, amo você. Eu sou muito feliz por ter você. O que eu não tive com os meus filhos não puderam fazer para mim, você faz. E eu sou feliz por isso. E peço a Deus por você todos os dias. <risos> Eu acho que todos nós, né, até pela minha crença, é, temos uma missão a cumprir aqui, nessa nossa breve passagem. E eu imagino que a missão do Daniel é uma missão muito especial, muito bonita. E eu acho que ele vai construir uma carreira muito sólida e realmente vai poder ser um exemplo para as pessoas que, como ele, um dia sonharam em transformar suas vidas através da arte. In my time in Amsterdam, I have uh, danced many roles and I have I've been exposed to many, many great uh, people and places and uh, I've changed so much. Uh, and I live very well. Um, and coming home, it's a, it's a big contrast uh, for me. Uh, which is something that is not, it's not new uh, because when I was living in Canada I would come back home every year and the first time that I came back home after six months I think was a, I mean I've been places before and I had traveled but it was not longer than a week or so and then being living somewhere completely different and, 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 and that's it and then coming back home and really noticing like how life was or is still because really had it haven't changed that much for them it, it, it's quite it, it's quite beautiful sad and humbling in a way um coming home for me it's a it's a humbling experience because i i have in a, i live in a total totally different environment and I am in contact every day with, with, with art, you know, and then coming home it's very uh, eye-opening. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>